Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about what this book is about? Go ahead, Aaron. Well, the book, uh, the, in a nutshell, is uh, a different perspective of the UFO phenomenon. The questions behind what they are and what their intention is. And I teamed up with Dr. McDaniel on this book uh, after the uh, 2008 sighting in Glenrose, Stephenville. And it really piqued my interest uh, at that particular time, although I've had a general interest in it for some time. And I began to do some more study on the subject. And as I began to look into it, I really began to understand that there was something that was real behind uh, this UFO phenomenon. But then I began to look into this a little bit more closely and understood that there was a connection to this that began to open up to me. And when I saw that connection, it dawned on me that there was something else behind what people were seeing. So the nature of the book is not only UFOs, uh, because everyone's written books on UFOs. It's not just another book on UFOs. It's a critical uh, look at what's behind their agenda and what their purpose is. And so the nature of the book is to simply um, look at the UFO phenomenon, at the historical aspects, but then get into something just a little bit deeper, and that is those winged serpents that we see throughout archaeology and history, and those giants, those Nephilim of Genesis 6, the mystery of the Sphinx, those stargates and some forbidden history, and connecting that to one common thread that really introduces something that uh, ties this whole thing together. And in Chapter 10, we sum it up in a chapter called The End That Game. You know, I um, just happened to interview um, Steve Allen two weeks ago, uh, who was the main eyewitness uh, there in Stephenville. And uh, that was quite a sighting. Uh, what, uh, what is your take on what was, was seen there? Because obviously something was seen uh, the, they had radar tracks on it and everything else, so obviously this thing did exist. What is your take on what it is and why it's here? Well, it's, it's interesting. I interviewed Mr. Allen for this book as well, and huh? he's one of the primary witnesses for the, for the uh, 2008 sighting. Uh, I call it the Glenrose Stephenville sighting because it was uh, initially seen in Glenrose heading towards Stephenville, uh, but primarily it's known as the Stephenville sighting. And from what we know of it so far, no one knows what it is. It's uh, hence, you know, why it's unidentified. Right. Now, it's interesting that Mr. Allen was about his normal business, um, and he's a pilot of uh, uh, 30 years, and so he's very experience with aircrafts and what flies in the air, etc. Not only did Mr. Allen see this, but business people throughout the area, ranchers. This is the area of the Southwest. These people are uh, mainly in ranching and cattle and rodeo. Uh, Stephenville, as a matter of fact, is the, uh, the one of the leading milk producers in the world. And so there's no agenda for anyone in this part of the country to come out, especially in the Bible Belt, to say, we saw a UFO. Right. I mean, it's just unheard of, especially ranchers and business people. Within These are small communities here, and everyone knows everyone, and, and it's just not going to happen. But what Mr. Allen saw and what the others saw shook them to the core. Matter of fact, Mr. Allen told me that he couldn't sleep for weeks after this sighting. Mm -hmm. No one knew what it was. It shook the mailman so bad that he, right after the sighting, he got in his truck and took off. Didn't say hi, didn't say bye, didn't say anything. He was gone. That's correct. So whatever it was, it really spooked him. 
Mr. Allen says that he saw a series of lights that were traveling at incredible speeds, and uh, then they they uh, changed positions into vertical positions, and he uh, described it as a very uh, white, bright light towards the end. And um, whatever it is, it was seen by multiple witnesses. This event was uh, actually denied by the uh, Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, because Mr. Allen and others saw what they thought were uh, some type of jets. Now, it turns out they were F-16s, but they saw jets flying at uh, low altitude at a very high rate of speed. Now, you can't, you can't get jets to fly low altitude without having permission from the uh, from their superiors to do so because you start rattling, you know, house windows and, and, and spooking cattle, and, and you just, you know, that just doesn't happen. Right. And, and with a series of uh, continued efforts through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, they were able to obtain those FAA reports, which clearly shows on radar a number of F-16s chasing something that is unidentified and has eluded them for several, several minutes. So, uh, matter of fact, the FAA said that they estimated the speed at roughly 1,600 miles per hour. And on radar, which I've seen the, uh, the video footage of the radar, you can clearly see it's eluding those F-16s um, in ways that should not be occurring. What it is, no one knows, but it is that particular sighting, along with a host of other sightings around the world that are ranked in the 3 to 5% of sightings that cannot be explained, and that is the nature of the UFO phenomenon. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, one thing that, that I found very interesting about Steve's account of what he saw was just prior to the object disappearing, it actually went up in flames. It, he saw like explosions of flames in the back. Yes, it's you know that really intrigued me as well. And in in the research that I've done for this book, we we've learned that um, whatever these things are now, I, I believe that they're um, uh, they're hyperdimensional, and and these hyperdimensional uh, 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 UFOs uh, are actually coming in they're they're beyond our time and space dimension so as they're entering into this time domain and into our dimensions as we know it those four dimensions length height width and time they are manipulating frequencies when they do that and hence they are changing light forms shapes and colors and i think that's why we're seeing what we're seeing we're not able to really make sense of it, but they're changing those frequencies somehow in those series of, of shapes and lights. And I think that's why Mr. Allen saw what he did. It's, it's that interaction that's uh, with those frequencies that I believe that they're creating, and we're seeing the residue of that, of their manipulation of our atmosphere. Now, now Aaron, before the 2008 uh, Stephenville sighting, were you into ufology prior to that? No, not not in particular. I was not. Um, now I had um, uh, a personal encounter when I was 17 years old. I write about it in the book, but uh, that that encounter always intrigued me. It's always kind of hasn't really bothered me. It's just that I didn't know what it was that I saw. Right. And so I went on with the you know with with the with the rest of my life and and it never really uh i never really had a clear-cut answer for that i never could understand it matter of fact i talked to some of my old high school buddies about it you know there were three of us uh three of those friends with me and so there were four of us total and you know i was still in contact with them and i asked them about it i said do you remember that night when you know and and they said yes it was the shamrock you know I, i've i've termed it the shamrock Texas sighting because that's where it occurred in Shamrock, Texas, the summer of 1988. I was 17 years old at the time, and um, we saw something very unusual in the sky. Uh, matter of fact, one of my friends 
uh, was going to go into the Air Force Academy uh, right after graduation, and he knew all about planes and jets, and and we all four agreed whatever we saw wasn't um, a normal aircraft. It wasn't a helicopter, wasn't any kind of fixed-wing aircraft. Matter of fact, it was just a solid red ball of light, and it was floating along uh, in the sky, and not very high up, uh, probably um, just up above the horizon, and uh, very slow, and just floating along, no sound to it whatsoever, completely silent, and no other uh, lights. There was no flashing lights, etc. And so we watched it for a while. Matter of fact, it intrigued us so much, we were getting ready to go home and get in the truck to go home. And this was about midnight. Uh, it intrigued us so much, we, we turned around and went back to the fence, and we watched it with, um, with intrigue. Mm. Uh, and then, however long it was, minutes later, uh, we watched it for probably a, a good 10 minutes. And uh, uh, the object then began to do very uh, weird uh, acrobatics in the air, 90-degree uh, turns, super fast, just things that could was totally impossible. Matter of fact, I, I, I remember this very clearly. I reached down and pinched my arm to see if I was <laughs> really awake or if I was dreaming because I tell you, after we saw that, it went back to a steady state, and it just was idle, uh, didn't float, just stood in, a, in an emotionless state, and no one said a word. And these are four, you know, we're, we're 17 years old. No one said a word. And um, we watched this, and we continued to watch it until it disappeared. But I never was interested in it uh, uh, up until, um, I guess, about 2008. It really caught my interest again because I was actually headed uh, to work that afternoon uh, right before the Stephenville sighting occurred in January 8, 2008. I was headed to work that particular uh, afternoon, and that sighting, matter of fact, I was going down the highway uh, I took a little bit different way to work because it's more scenic, and as the sun sets in the west, you can kind of see a big overlook across the, the the valley there, and it's a beautiful, you know, scenic drive through there. And I had a little bit more time; I left a little early, so I thought I'd take that way to watch the sunset. And uh, that now I didn't see anything, but apparently, 15 to 20 minutes after I had gone through that area, that same area, that sighting occurred. Now, I heard about it hours later. Wow. But uh, and then that's when Dr. McDaniel, um, uh, uh, you know, began to do a study on on this, and and we teamed up to write this book, Alien Agenda: The Return of the Nephilim. Now, uh, Dr. McDaniel, um, were you into ufology prior to 2008, or prior to meeting up with Dr. Uh, Judkins? Yeah, actually, you know, I have a little bit of a different story. I did. I, I did get involved in the literature and, and did do quite a bit of research and uh, co compiled a lot of notes, and it was really interesting to me. I, I, don't, uh, I don't have um, an experience that led me into that, but uh, it was more of uh, being faced with all the evidence that was out there and, and, and trying to weed through that. Of course, anybody that's that studied this phenomenon knows that, um, you know, the hoaxes are everywhere, and that's too bad because uh, that really that really makes the legitimate sightings uh, difficult. Absolutely. But I did, uh, I did, I did have an interest in that, and did a lot of work on that. And I can remember, you know, following. You know, they used to. Uh, you don't hear much talk about it anymore, but in the old days, you know, they used to talk about the UFO flaps that happened about every four years, and you know, you'd get you know, an extended series of months in which there would be an increase in the number of sightings of UFOs and, and encounters and those kinds of things. And um, I, I do remember seeing, you know, at some point, but it was years after I'd been involved in this, some, some acrobatics by a light in the sky, but it was so far away, there was absolutely no way I could really verify what it, what it was. And um, what it was doing was something contrary to... You know anything I'd ever seen anything in the air do, but it, I, I really wasn't close enough. Um, 
uh, you know, to be able to, to say, boy, this was, you know, it was impactful, um, that really wasn't the case for me. But I did interview some other people that did have some, uh, more than just a sighting with a UFO, we've actually, and, and we talk about this a bit in our book as well, um, talked to some of the folks who claim to have been abducted mm -hmm. and taken aboard a UFO. Now, well, when you talk about that, you're really talking about something now where um, it's real easy now to fake it. Yes. And um, the, the one area that I'm, uh, in fact, the one interview that I actually conducted that I put in the book is uh, by a fellow named Charlie Hickson over in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And, um, uh, and a number of years ago, Charlie and his friend were out fishing and claimed to have been uh, frozen in place for you know, lack of a more technical term for him to use, and they were, he described being taken aboard a craft, and um, for things being done to him, his memory was real sketchy about it, and then being dumped back off at the same place, and, and both, both of them awakening. Now, I did not ever interview his friend, but Charlie Hickson told me uh, that that man that was with him Went into um, went into a mental hospital and did not come out, and um, <laughs> that that was intriguing to me because I I always wondered what was the difference, um, and of course you know Charlie recounts this thing you know with um, you know the the kind of emotion that you would think would happen you know for someone that uh, that had that happen to them. But for this other fella, you know, um, I have to tell you, if you were faking it, that'd be a pretty high price to pay uh, to spend your days in a mental hospital. Yeah, and um, they, they didn't uh, necessarily uh, try to promote the heck out of this thing, right? Oh, no, they didn't. No, I actually had to kind of dig that up. Yeah. Uh, it was only because I had an interest in the thing that I ever came across it in the first place. Yeah, you're right. You know, because it seems to me once once money gets involved, the, then I start looking at it at a different angle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if people are doing yeah. that, well, well, tell us um, how did you two gentlemen end up getting together to work on this well, book? Oh, oh, well, you know, um, I'd had this interest in UFOs, and I had done some I'd done some work on that, and I had. Um, I'd actually um, uh, taped a, a, um, about a, a two-hour, just a little short DVD that uh, kind of talked about the UFO phenomenon because um, uh, I, not only did I have an interest in it, but I had a real desire to know what was really behind that. Um, and there are a lot of different ideas about what that is. I know you remember the old Eric Von Daniken book, Chariots of the Gods, right. you know, and he talked about our Sky Brothers and, you know, and all that kind of business. And, and, then, and then you have other folks that come along with other ideas. And the part that really intrigued me was, what really is this? And is there a connection to this? Because, as you know, the thread that runs through, uh, you know, if you're following uh, any of the encounters of UFOs, that thing has been linked to just about everything imaginable. And I, I really had a desire to sort through that. Well... Knowing Aaron, Aaron's been a friend of gosh, Aaron, how long have we been friends? I don't know how many years, but, you know, Aaron, um, his doctorate and uh, his real area of expertise is archaeology. And just get Aaron talking about all of the winged serpents that you find all around the world. And as a matter of fact, not only that, but the hieroglyphs that show what genuinely appears to be spacecraft. Now, boy, when you when you unearth something that's just been covered, you know, for hundreds or a thousand years, and you've got you've got what looks like a spacecraft etched in the wall, and and men looking up at it, that's a pretty amazing thing. And um, and so since that was Aaron's area of expertise, and he brought all that to the table, and then, you know, I had a. a and, of course, this book, there's no way. I mean, you, I'm sure you've seen the literature. In, in fact, that was one of the things we had to avoid. Uh, the first time I actually filmed a, a DVD study of this, it was just overkill uh, because of, you know, trying to prove the point. 
and taking the sightings back through history and bringing them up to present day, talking about the credible ones to try to prove to people that there really was something out there. Uh, but, but I think we did a, a good job of, of not overpowering everybody with that, but it was Aaron's expertise in the archaeology area, of which I don't really have any of that, and, and then, you know, the research that I've done in the past, and we thought that'd just make a perfect marriage for the book. It, it sure sounds like it. Um, now, Dr. Judkins, there's something in your <clears throat> bio that really caught my eye uh, regarding uh, you being credited with mapping uh, the longest contiguous dinosaur trackway in the Western Hemisphere near Glen Rose, Texas. Is that a coincidence or what? I mean, do you see any connection between this dinosaur thing and the fact of this huge sighting? Well, I don't know that it has any connection in particular to the dinosaurs. Uh, I do think that it's connected to the Glen Rose Stephenville area uh, for another reason, and that is that Glen Rose um, in the county of, of uh, 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 Glen Rose is Somerville County, and they actually have a nuclear plant um, in the county. Oh. Now, uh, a lot of these sightings have been and occurred around nuclear plants. Yes. Now, this wasn't seen directly over the nuclear plant. It was seen um, near the nuclear plant as it was heading towards Stephenville, according to Mr. Allen. Uh, and, and others' testimony. But I think that may have something to do with it more than the dinosaurs. Now, did the dinosaurs have any any role in that at all? I don't think so. Matter of fact, we've had uh, people come down and, and, um, and say that the dinosaurs and the aliens were together at the time. Now, I don't personally believe that, but what I do think is that there are uh, those fallen angels that have uh, interacted with mankind throughout history, and we see evidence of that in the archaeological record. Now, what they were doing and why they were doing it is a different, you know, is a whole different thing. But they're not here to um, to embrace mankind as the uh, as the thought, uh, you know, in, in today's society really purports. I believe they're here for a different reason, and it's not one to help mankind. So you believe that they're. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I believe that they they have a very malevolent nature about them, um, and I and and there's reasons why about that. But it's interesting you 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 bring up the uh, the Glen Rose areas because um, uh, back in the 1980s, uh, along that same river, uh, which is the Paluxy River near Glen Rose, Texas, was uh, uh, along the banks of that river is uh, um, you know, thousands of dinosaur tracks of different uh, kinds. Oh. Uh, also, fossil human footprints, but in the 1980s, <clears throat> one particular footprint was excavated that I have in the book, and we, we have the only known cast of this. It is a 24-inch human fossil footprint. Well, that, that's where I have to stop you because I've got, I've got a question. Now, um, obviously, you guys are offering an answer or at least a theory as to what is behind these, these UFOs. And for people that don't understand or don't know what, a, what the Nephilim are or were, can you uh, define that a little bit? Uh, uh, Dr. McDaniel, you want to take that, or do you want me to Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, Aaron's mentioned the fossil record, and, and I, know, I know what our discussion is about here, and, and you know, and we've written the book from that perspective, but um, uh, I, and, and I don't want to turn the discussion totally in that direction, but in the biblical record as well, there is an account in Genesis 6 about those those angels that um, are the evil angels that cohabited with men. Now, 
that's not just in the biblical record. There are actually non-biblical uh, manuscripts that contain those same kinds of accounts. But the reason I bring that up is because the biblical record says that when they cohabited with men, with the daughters of men, that they produced a race of giants. And those giants uh, became men of old, men of renown, the Bible says. And as a matter of fact, I think what you can do is you can actually trace back a lot of the mythology to what was going on with those races of giants. And, and you find them all through, not just uh, in the archaeological record or in the historical record and in the biblical record. Those things don't seem to contradict in this area. So when we're talking about Nephilim, we're talking about not just some very large human beings, but we're actually talking about a hybrid being. One that would be, and I, and, and, I, and I realize that there may be some people who are a little bit familiar with the Bible that may be listening to this, and they're going to be looking at a note, maybe in their Schofield Bible, that says that, well, that can't be right because, you know, angels are sexless. But that's not a true statement. Uh, every single reference in the Bible regarding an angel is male, and that is without exception. I did not and, know that. Um, those, yes. And, and by the way, there's something else about that, too. Angels in your Bible are wingless. Uh, ain't, ain't, there's not one single angel that has wings. Now, cherubim, which is a different creature, has wings. Seraphim, which is another type of, of angelic creature, has wings. Angels do not have wings. And, and if you were to see an angel, they have the ability. You know, and Aaron talked about out of our dimension, our, out of our time and space boundaries, and that's absolutely true. And they have the ability to appear as men and have done that. But they also have the ability to appear as an angel, and that's a totally different thing. In fact, that's a terrifying thing. And, so, and what you're real, I'm sorry? Uh, no, so are you saying that these, these angels came down to earth mated with the human women that were already here and and created these giant offspring that are then called nephilim that is correct now that is correct besides finding this this huge footprints are there any other um archaeological finds as far as bones that would indicate these things were on Earth at some time? Uh, well, actually, there is. Now, uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, just by the time you get into uh, the Roman period, uh, Caesar Gaius uh, was um, a man who, uh, he, he was known as Mac Maximinus Thrax, and uh, he uh, stood eight foot six inches tall now, uh, that's a big man, and men get that big today. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal has a, 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 a foot size, I think, of a, of a 15 or so. So that's not what we're talking about, though. We're talking about not just big, large men uh, that suffers from, you know, uh, you know uh, overstimulation of their anterior pituitary gland. Um, uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about... Uh, modern-day giantism, we're talking about a, a breed of hybrid fallen angels and humans. And as a matter of fact, my uh, one of my other colleagues, Joe Taylor from the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum, um, has a 47-inch human femur that came um, out of the uh, road construction uh, from the 1950s. There was a report in southeast Turkey um, that had, uh, um, as they were uh, digging uh, and excavating for a highway through there in the, in, the, in the 1950s, the road crew came across a huge human femur. Now, according to that report, it was 47 inches long, and that fits right along the uh, biblical record of Deuteronomy 3.11 that talks about King Og of Bashan. So Joe Taylor of uh, the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum sculpted this 47-inch human femur to scale and uh, if, uh, 
so so the 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 tip of the of this you know to put it to scale the tip of the person's hand would be just above your head if you were about six foot so these are these are uh, incredible um, reports coming out of history from uh, Rhone in 1613. We have a report of a 30-foot giant. Um, Angola, uh, who was about 21 foot. Um, in 1577, there was one report uh, from Dr. Plater uh, at Lucerne of a, re of, a, of a giant remains of about 19 foot. And then you get the giants of uh, Patagonia, who were between 11 and 15 foot. Now, even more recent than that, in uh, uh, Lovelock Cave in, um, um, in Nevada, and you get Arizona and New Mexico, all throughout that region, you have reports of red-haired giants. And even the American Indians talk about this, especially at Lovelock Cave. Yes. Matter yes. of fact, they have found um, several giant skulls at Lovelock Cave that um as well as some pestles a pestle is a big yeah normally it's a big rock that they use to grind stone i mean to uh, excuse me to uh, to grind uh, grain against another you know uh, another stone surface they would grind it for meal and they found one pestle um that was uh, at least 25 pounds and they found another one even larger than that and um uh, it would take two grown men to lift that thing up to use it that wasn't normal. Uh, so there was something going on over at Lovelock and throughout that region, even just, you know, um, within our recent times, that something was happening over there that it really scared those American uh, Native Indians. So we do have reports throughout history. Now, unfortunately, a lot of those uh, remains, with the exception of Lovelock, I should add, uh, those remains are verified, and they're they're uh, uh, they're in the museum. Now, now I don't think they're a public display, but <clears throat> but they're known and they're they're there. But without exception, most of these have been lost throughout history, or they've been taken by the Smithsonian, uh, which is a very unusual thing uh, mm. because they tend to get locked up and never seen the light of day again. Well, let me ask you a question, okay. and and this might be just totally off the wall. But if indeed we had this race of 30-foot giants, uh, what we would f refer to as giants, could they have been involved in any way in building the pyramids? Being able um, to, to pick up such big stones and, or doing any of that work? Well, you know, no one knows for sure that to, 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 to say something would be speculation and conjecture. But we all have a, a, a theory, and until you know, those theories come you know, with, with some hard evidence, no one can say for sure. Um, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Uh, those forbidden, um, uh, those fallen angels that, that at the time of Enoch that were teaching that forbidden knowledge to men, and uh, matter of fact, the book of Enoch, uh, specifically names those fallen angels and what they were teaching. Now, could they have, you know, implemented, you know, those sciences to help men? That's indeed possible. Did they? I don't know. No one has learned the answer to that. That That's the million-dollar question. Uh, how did those pyramids get built? Matter of fact, I was over there uh, to investigate that in 2008 myself, got to uh, climb into the Great Pyramid and up into the king's chamber wow. and let me tell you when you're there visiting and you see that pyramid for the first time i've seen it in pictures and, and uh, but let me tell you when you stand next to it and you look up real uh perspective they are huge it's incredible and that's everyone walks away scratching their heads no one really knows but i just have a hard time believing that man did that by themselves. Is it possible yeah. that they did it by themselves? Yes. Is it possible that they had intervention? I think certainly the possibility is yes. I totally yeah, agree. Especially, yeah, especially when you look at, you know, how those buildings are configured and, and the fact that, you know, they the, the face of true north as opposed to even our ability today to orient a building with the precision of those pyramids 
it's really a remarkable feat. And and if I can just interject, Aaron and I have had discussions about this over and over. We we both tend to look at those pyramids as being pre-flood, which would be right during the time of the Nephilim. But but if I can interject this, the byline of our book really really talks about what we're what we're talking about when we're talking about this this race of of hybrid giants and that is that there's a real possibility and and if what we think is if if our understanding of the things that we see are correct those nephilim are going to be back now uh, now that's going to change it from just being an archaeological discovery to being a present reality on the earth right now let me ask you this uh with some of the other craft that have been um, seen and described, uh, they seem like they would uh, carry uh, some type of being that is smaller than us, maybe three foot or four foot. Now, are you saying that these crafts would also be carrying these larger giants? No. 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 Oh, okay. Well, then I, I must be a little confused here. So, when they come well, back, they, what would they what would they look like? What? Well, when they come back, they will be giants. Now, when those when those are back, but again, if our understanding is correct, that is going to happen at a specific point in time, because that's not going to be happenstance. That is going to be part of a deception that has been perpetrated from the very beginning continues through this day and what's happening uh, and to a large degree because so much of this is seen and yet not able to be identified it's it's almost it almost defies imagination to think of all the things that you're able to see which we know don't happen you know within the the things that we consider to be normal and yet you just can't get a handle on that any better. I mean, of course, the term UFO. Well, here's the point. This is, we, we believe that this is all nothing more than warming everyone up to the day in which this deception is going to come to its zenith. And, and when those, what guys like Von Daniken and other guys like that would call, you know, the gods or, 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 or aliens from other galaxies or whatever you'd want to call it, you know, they are actually out in those heavens, but they're not what people think they are, at least if, if what we understand is correct. And that's that they're not just another, you know, group of humanoids that happen to be just a little bit different from us, that, you know, evolution happened to line up just exactly right and bring about but that these are beings that, are, that actually predate the earth and, um, and were in place, and there, there is an agenda behind them, and, uh, and they're perpetrating that agenda. And, and I believe, and, and Aaron shares this belief as well, and I know it sounds far-fetched, but they're actually rolling out the carpet so that everyone kind of perceives them in a certain way because at the end of the day they will be back and 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 they will have and they will gain uh control of this earth and um and the nephilim are going to be uh, uh, we, we believe that it's uh, from the things that we understand about that there's a very big possibility that the nephilim will return as part of that agenda well, what are your thoughts as far as government knowledge? Do you think the U.S. government has any of this knowledge? You know, I, now I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think, and then, Aaron, you can jump in, you know, if, if you know of something else. I'm going to tell you what, what I believe the government knows about this. Uh, the only thing I think they know are the reports that they hear from their, their own people. Astronauts have given testimony about things that they have seen and encountered, uh, any kind of hard physical evidence that they may have seen. If you've ever, 
you know, if you ever go out to Roswell and talk to anybody out there, you know, that, uh, of course, you know, what do they really have? You know, they're never going to admit that. I think they see those kinds of things, but do they see what, you know, what is maybe moving behind all of this? No, I don't think so at all. Uh, I think they're going to default to the standard position of, um, at, at the very worst case, to say, no, you know what, this is just an intelligence from somewhere else that, you know, happened to be here, and, and um, you know, their reluctance to talk about that is, you know, for their own reasons, but I, I don't think it goes any further than that. Now, Aaron, do you disagree with that? No, I, I don't. I, I believe that the government knows about this. Um, uh, they don't know what it is exactly, but uh, for sure they know about it. There's been too many reports from people high up in NASA, the astronauts, um, um, from different missions all the way back to Apollo, that they were seeing something. And these these are uh, men of uh, professionalism and integrity, right. and I don't think they would come out and, and put their – careers or their reputations on the line saying they would see something if they didn't. So what does the government know? No one knows. But I do think they have some knowledge. We just don't know how far the rabbit hole goes. Well, you know, one thing that I've, I've come to <clears throat> learn, I guess you could say, uh, from doing this show is that there are two main factions within the UFO community. You have your, your scientific viewpoint, and then you have a biblical uh, viewpoint. And I think those are the two largest groups within the community. Um, but what I've found is that it's very hard to talk about the UFO topic strictly scientific or strictly biblical. There, there does seem to be some type of mix in there. Um, but what, what, do you, what are you trying to get across in this book? Are you just trying to get people awoken uh, to what you believe is going to happen? Is that the basis for this book or, or just for knowledge? Well, it's, 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 really, um, it's really a combination. The, the, the first intention is to wake people up to, to this real occurring phenomenon. Now, uh, does everyone uh, believe it? No. I, I wasn't sure that I believed it, even though I had seen something. Uh, I didn't know what it was, but most people that are not familiar with something tend to shy away from it. And what we want to do with this book is bring this uh, information to light to let people know that what is occurring is real. Those, those 3 to 5 percent of cases that are not explained as natural ph uh, phenomenon or misidentification or the planet Venus or, or whatever uh, is, is a real occurring phenomenon. And people are really experiencing something. I experienced that uh, UFO in 1988. But what's going on behind the scenes is something totally different, and a lot of the experiences that people are are having now, uh, some are, are are not so good experiences, but some are reporting to have good experiences. Like Whitley Schreiber would be one of those uh, in his book Communion that he wrote way back when, and 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 he talks about this. He's very open and and inviting to these invitations, but there's a. a um, there's an agenda behind that, and so the book is to unveil that agenda of why they are here and what their intention is. And, and, and once you understand that, that uh, they are malevolent in nature, their game, their end game is deception, and they are not here to help humanity, it brings a whole nother light on the UFO phenomenon because there's a connection that's associated with this that uh, will lead people into a misunderstanding if they embrace something as an ET from another planet, say the planet Nibiru or the planet X or what have you, that we are here to help you. Now, if you watch any of the movies or, or you go back and, and you notice that if there's any kind of, of, of common thread against the Earth, 
that mankind <clears throat> tends to pull together as one. Right. And so um, I believe that, that this connection is the evolution connection. And, and, and back in the 1980s, Shirley MacLaine stood on the shores of the Pacific Ocean and, and proclaimed herself to be God. And, and I believe that evolution connection is associated with this uh, – in, in the panspermia theory and the cosmic evolution that says that, okay, if, if life evolved, then life should be out there somewhere else. Now, that's what evolution says. Um, however, these um, um, entities are not from other planets. They are very hyperdimensional. They are never seen entering or exiting our atmosphere. They are already here, and they have been here, and they are those fallen angels that have um, uh, been here on this earth as long as mankind has been here. That's why we've seen them throughout history, and their purpose is to deceive mankind, and there's a coming delusion that's coming down the pike that is even going to get worse, and I believe they're using this UFO and evolution connection for the next stage of of, – of 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 the evolution, uh, which says that you're at your pinnacle now. Well, we're here to show you how to become your own gods. That's the that's where this is heading, and it's surely and it's surely uh, McLean's I am all over again. Uh, so, um, but they are 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 very deceptive in in that re- regard. And what's coming down the pike is is going to be a a, uh, a something. Far worse than any movie that's out there now. Yeah, that's true. The, you know, the truth of it is going to be stranger than fiction. And, you know, just from my standpoint, you know, Aaron um, nutshelled exactly why we wrote this book. There are a number of people that would just look at anyone that ever gave any credence to UFOs uh, as though they were some kind of a nut, and that is not the case. And, um, and we have an idea of what we think that is, and we're trying to put it forth in this book. And if we're right then this is more than just a couple of guys with a theory. If we're right, there is a lot hinging on this. And um, Well, it sounds so, like the entire mankind is hinging on it. Well, it, it is. That's, yeah, it that's is. what I'm... <laughs> yeah, now, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, do you think that we are going to start seeing more activities in the sky? in the coming years or is it going to be sooner than that or um you know what I, let me feel that aaron and then you can jump in there if you want to sure, go ahead here's what i'm going to tell you what my understanding of this is and and i'm just going to give it to you in a nutshell because i'm looking at the clock and i know this is winding up there is an event that has to take place it is going to be cataclysmic and only after that event I mean, you're going to see what you're seeing now. You're, you're, it's going to, I, I believe, and, and time will tell if I'm right or not. Things are going to continue just the way they are. You're going to have some giving testimony about, you know, close encounters, and, and you're going to get all of that. But there is going to be a, a world-changing event, and after that event, you're going to see all of this radically change and become much more open and much more prolific. In a good now, way or a bad way, though. <laughs> no, in a well, it's going to be in a bad way if I'm right. Right. Uh, and I and you know, and it's not that I want to be right. It's just that that's the way I perceive it. You know, based on what I know. But but now to to get back to answer that question, is that go, when is that going to happen? Um, I'm just going to be honest with you and tell you that while I'm real sure about the event, I I I, I can't say that I have. Uh, that I understand it enough to be able to tell you, yeah, this is going to happen in the next year or the next 10 years, or um, I can't do that. I I do know there are some things that are going to be happening, particularly within um, within the mindset of men, that I think are going to be an indicator of this, but um, I, I can't accurately do that. I know people would love to do that, and you know, even folks that are into the biblical end of this, you know, they love date setting, and, you know, they love to, to be able to pin that down. But I'm going to be honest with you and tell you, while I'm real sure about what I'm saying about it, I'm just as equally unsure about the date. Mm. So 
in your book, and, and I, I know we can't get too deep into this, um, so obviously you're offering an explanation. Now, when you get into the book, do you have factual information that you use to uh, try to prove this theory, or is it all anecdotal uh, evidence, a little of both? Well, the, the the book is uh, is well referenced. We we do use a mix of of secular sources and uh, non secular sources, uh, scientific and other uh, personal testimony, historical sightings, etc. So we do have, a, uh, I think, a very well rounded book in that regard. Um, as far as the documentation, we we have several, um, um, you know, literature sources that we used and. And uh, to to really bring about um, uh, what's going on with this UFO phenomenon, and and then we wrap it up and and uh, uh, in the forbidden history, and and we talk about those winged serpents and the uh, mystery of the Sphinx, and and how that all ties in. It's interesting that in the ancients, you know, if you take uh, uh, you know the 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 pyramids in Egypt and the pyramids of the Mayans in South America. In, in any major site around the world, they're on the same latitude line. And back in the ancient past, it was 22.5 degrees latitude. Why is that? They were following those same constellations. Mm -hmm. We write about it in the chapter on stargates. Oh. Uh, they were doing something in particular and with those pyramids. That's why they're, they're connected. See, this whole, this whole evolution thing that says that man – you know, arrived, they were all separated, and they, therefore they shouldn't have the same knowledge. They do. We see it. It's, it's everywhere, and, and even mainstream scientists are now picking this up and saying there's a connection. Why are these pyramids similar? Why are they following the, you know, the, the, the same constellations? Why are they very similar in technology? Matter of fact, uh, you go to Peru and, and you look at Machu Picchu or, or any of these megalithic sites – how did they – I mean, we talked about the pyramids earlier. How did they get those stones in place? There are hundreds of tons. <clears> and how did, they, how did they match the design uh, when they uh, had no knowledge of, of these other people? Well, and that's the thing. I mm. think they did have knowledge. Oh, I they must they, have. They must have. I think they did have the knowledge. <clears throat> and, and, and the evidence uh, empirically shows that they did. This was – this was not uh, this is not an evolution scenario. It totally goes against the grain of evolution, and and that cuts that cuts to the heart of of what we're being spoon fed. Yeah. What we're being told is not correct. We well, are being fed, I think, a, a lie that says that that you know we we came separately from you know through these roots of a supposed evolution, and that's not what we're seeing th throughout the history. Well, you know, there's there's basically two concepts, right? There's either the 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 God concept that you know where, boom, we were here, and then there's the the evolution theory, um, and I don't even know what they're teaching kids these days uh, when it comes to to evolution. Are they still teaching them that we came from monkeys or? Oh sure, they're they're teaching the macroevolutionary concept, and they have, and they will continue to do so, and that's totally in the public ed education. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, guys, uh, we are getting a little uh, down on time here. Uh, I want to repeat uh, if you could repeat the name of the book and also where people can find it. Go ahead, Mike. Well, the the name of the book is Alien Agenda. The Return of the Nephilim. And uh, because it's just out, um, there's a couple of places they can go. Uh, we've got our websites right now. And then, uh, folks, we'll be able to order this online uh, before too long. They'll be able to go on Barnes & Noble and Amazon, and they'll be able to pick this book up. Um, but you can, um, <clears throat> you can go to a couple of places. Aaron, give them your website. In the, fact, the, 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 the book has a website, even. The book has a website. It's alien-agenda.com alien-agenda.com and uh or you can go to graceage.org um and then you can also go to my website it's aaronjudkins.com what was the second one grace graceage.org great uh, primarily the books available now on alien-agenda.com 
and um, but those other websites will eventually lead you to and and we'll have it, we'll have it mainstream uh, on on Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Matter of fact, the book's going to debut this May nineteenth, twenty twelve, in Glen Rose, Texas, at the UFO Symposium. Oh. Uh, a bunch of UFO uh, international speakers are coming in for this event. The ladies and the, the yes and and at the UFO Symposium and the book will debut there, and uh, and so we're hoping to get a really good response from that. Great, great. Yeah, I uh, I interviewed uh, Paula, uh, who kind of spearheaded that whole thing. If it's the same one, I'm sure. thinking up. It, it is the same one, and and people have to register if you want to go. So you got to pay a fee. You can't just walk in. It's, yeah, that's right. Uh, but I think if you go to www.starworksusa.com, starworksusa.com, you can pre-register for the event there. It'll be May uh, 18th, which is the the evening of, but the the, the actual event the speakers will be May 19th, uh, which is a Saturday, and I believe they go into the 20th. And I think they they're going to go out to uh, one of the private ranches and do some stargazing one night. So it should be should be interesting, should be fun. There's going to be a wide range of uh, views there. People uh, uh, from uh, international speakers and the witnesses from the Stephenville Glenrow sighting will be there. Mr. Allen will be there, and it'll be a great time to get to talk and uh, hear these people firsthand. Now, will you guys be there at all on any of the panels or anything? Uh, we, we're not going to be on the speaking panel because it's a uh, it's primarily the women speakers. Right. But we will be there at the symposium, uh, debuting the book, and we'll be there signing autographs, et cetera, and talking to people. Uh, about the book and about other people's work, we're we're interested in what other people have to say as well. So it's going to be a great time to 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 get to meet people there, and we hope to see you there. Yeah, um, I would love to uh, talk to you guys again uh, after the book is out and people have had a chance to read it, uh, you know, and and hear what the feedback is. Now, let let me ask you, uh, with uh, with your book, is it? Uh, an easy read for people that are not very biblical, in a sense. Is it a biblical style book, or is it, uh, you know, is do you need biblical knowledge to understand a lot of this stuff? No, I don't. I don't think so, Rick. You know, um, I, I think that the book is is written so that anyone can pick it up, and even if they don't have a background uh, in UFOs, even if they just have a, a casual interest in it. I think it's done in a milk-to-meat fashion. It starts you off with the evidence, first of all, and, and begins to walk you through that. And then as we introduce our idea of what we believe is going on and why we believe that, then that's kind of presented there. And uh, we've tried to keep it simple, um, and, and we've tried to keep it short. That's why the, you know, the book is only about 210 pages or so. And um, it's, it's like, kind of like, kind of like, cramming one of the nephilim in a matchbox but um <laughs> but but uh, i i think to honestly answer your question i think it's a pretty easy read good good well listen i wish you guys the best of luck uh with this book i'm looking forward to reading it myself good luck down in glen rose uh later on this month and uh thanks for taking the time to talking with us tonight well, thanks, thanks for Rick, having for having us on. Okay. You guys have a great uh, great evening, and we'll stay in touch. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good night. Well, that was extremely interesting. Um, you know, like I said, uh, I seem to see two factions with this UFO community, uh, one being the scientific, one being the biblical as far as the viewpoints uh, towards UFOs. Uh, before starting this show, uh, I was strictly scientific uh, as far as my viewpoint. And uh, after listening to a few of the guests that have brought in a more biblical uh, view, there are things there that you can't ignore, I, I must say. Um, it just adds another piece to the puzzle. So anyway, thanks everyone for watching tonight. Uh, again, that book was Alien Agenda, The Return of the Nephilim, and it should be uh, available uh, very soon, or you can go out to alien-agenda.com um, to order it. All right, thank you guys and gals. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.
In uh, uh, Love Block Cave, in um, um, in Nevada, and you get Arizona and New Mexico. All throughout that region, you have reports of red-haired giants, and even the American Indians talk about this, especially at Love Block Cave. Yes. Matter yes. of fact, they have found um, several giant skulls at Love Block Cave, that um, as well as some pestles. A pestle is a big yeah, normally it's a big rock that they use to grind stone. I mean, to uh, excuse me, to uh, to grind uh, grain against another, you know, uh, another stone surface. They would grind it for meal, and they found one pestle um, that was uh, at least 25 pounds, and they found another one even larger than that. And um, uh, it would take two grown men to lift that thing up to use it. That wasn't normal. Uh, so there was something going on over at Lovelock and throughout that region, even just, you know, um, within our recent times, that something was happening over there that it really scared those American uh, Native Indians. So we do have reports throughout history. Now, unfortunately, a lot of those uh, remains, with the exception of Lovelock, I should add, uh, those remains are verified and they're, they're, uh, uh, they're in the museum. Now, now I don't think they're a public display, but but they're known and they're they're there. But without exception, most of these have been lost throughout history, or they've been taken by the Smithsonian, uh, which is a very unusual thing, uh, mm. because they tend to get locked up and never seen the light of day again. Well, let me ask you a question, and and this might be just totally off the wall, but if indeed we had this race of thirty foot giants. Uh, what we would f refer to as giants. Could they have been involved in any way in building the pyramids? Being able um, to, to pick up such big stones and or doing any of that work? Well, you know, no one knows for sure. That to, 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 to say something would be speculation and conjecture. But we all have a, a, a theory and until you know those theories come, you know, with with some hard evidence, no one can say for sure. Um, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Uh, those forbidden, um, uh, those fallen angels that that at the time of Enoch, that were teaching that forbidden knowledge to men. And uh, matter of fact, the Book of Enoch uh, specifically names those fallen angels and what they were teaching. Now, could they have, you know, implemented? You know those sciences to help man. That's indeed possible. Did they? I... You know, I. Now I'm I'm going to tell you what I think, and then Aaron, you can jump in. You know, if if you know of something else, I'm going to tell you what what I believe the government knows about this. Uh, the only thing I think they know are the reports that they hear from their their own people. Astronauts have given testimony about things that they have seen and encountered. Uh, any kind of hard physical evidence that they may have seen if you've ever <laughs> you know if you ever go out to Roswell and talk to anybody out there you know that uh, of course you know what do they really have you know they're never going to admit that I think they see those kinds of things but do they see what you know what is maybe moving behind all of this no I don't think so at all uh, I think they're going to default to the standard position of um, at, at the very worst case, to say, no, you know what, this is just an intelligence from somewhere else that, you know, happened to be here, and, and um, you know, their reluctance to talk about that is, you know, for their own reasons, but I, I don't think it goes any further than that. Aaron, do you disagree with that? No, I, I don't. I, 
I believe that the government knows about this. Um, uh, they don't know what it is exactly, but uh, for sure they know about it. There's been too many reports from people high up in NASA, the astronauts, um, um, from different missions all the way back to Apollo, that they were seeing something. And these these are uh, men of uh, professionalism and integrity, right. and I don't think they would come out and, and put their – careers or their reputations on the line saying they would see something if they didn't. So what does the government know? No one knows. But I do think they have some knowledge. We just don't know how far the rabbit hole goes. Well, you know, one thing that I've, I've come to <clears throat> learn, I guess you could say, uh, from doing this show is that there are two main factions within the UFO community. You have your, your scientific viewpoint, and then you have a biblical uh, viewpoint. And I think those are the two largest groups within the community. Um, but what I've found is that it's very hard to talk about the UFO topic strictly scientific or strictly bi biblical. There, there does seem to be some type of mix in there. Um, but what, what, do you, what are you trying to get across in this book? Are you just trying to get people awoken uh, to what you believe is going to happen? Is that the basis for this book? or Actually denied by the uh, Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, because Mr. Allen and others saw what they thought were uh, some type of jets. Now, it turns out they were F-16s, but... They saw jets flying at uh, low altitude at a very high rate of speed. Now, you can't, you can't get jets to fly low altitude without having permission from, the, uh, from their superiors to do so because you start rattling, you know, house windows and, and, and spooking cattle, and, and you just, you know, that just doesn't happen. Right. And, and with a series of uh, continued efforts through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, they were able to obtain those FAA reports, which clearly shows on radar a number of F-16s chasing something that is unidentified and has eluded them for several, several minutes. So, uh, matter of fact, the FAA said that they estimated the speed at roughly 1,600 miles per hour and on radar which I've seen the, uh, the video footage of the radar, you can clearly see it's eluding those F-16s um, in ways that should not be occurring. What it is, no one knows, but it is that particular sighting, along with a host of other sightings around the world that are ranked in the 3 to 5% of sightings that cannot be explained, and that is the nature of the UFO phenomenon. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um... You know, one thing that, that I found very interesting about Steve's account of what he saw was just prior to the object disappearing, it actually went up in flames. It, he saw, like, explosions of flames in the back. Yes. it's You know, that really intrigued me as well. And in, in the research that I've done for this book, we, we've learned that, um, whatever these things are now, I, I believe that they're um, uh, they're hyperdimensional, and and these hyperdimensional uh, 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 UFOs uh, are actually coming in. They're they're beyond our time and space dimension. So as they're entering into this time domain and into our dimensions as we know it, those four dimensions: length, height, width, and time. They are manipulating frequencies when they do that, and hence they are changing light, forms, shapes, and colors. And I think that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. We're not able to really make sense of it, but they're changing those frequencies somehow in those series of, of shapes and lights. And I think that's why Mr. Allen saw what he did. Do that. I know people would love to do that. And you know, even folks that are into the biblical end of this, you know, they love date setting, and, you know, they love to, to be able to pin that down. But I'm going to be honest with you and tell you 
while I'm real sure about what I'm saying about it, I'm just as equally unsure about the date. Mm. So in your book, and, and I, I know we can't get too deep into this, um, so obviously you're offering an explanation. Now, when you get into the book, do you have factual information that you use to uh, try to prove this theory? Or is it all anecdotal uh, evidence, a little of both? Well, the, the, the book is, uh, is well referenced. We, we do use a mix of, of secular sources and uh, non-secular sources, uh, scientific and other, uh, personal testimony, historical sightings, etc. So we do have, uh, I think, a very well-rounded book in that regard. Um, as far as the documentation, we, we have several, um, um, you know, literature sources that we used and, and uh, to, to really bring about um, uh, what's going on with this UFO phenomenon. And then and, and we wrap it up in, in, uh, uh, in the forbidden history, and, and we talk about those winged serpents and the uh, mystery of the Sphinx and, and how that all ties in. It's interesting that in the ancients, you know, if you take – uh, uh, you know the, the the pyramids in Egypt and the pyramids of the Mayans in South America, and in any major site around the world, they're on the same latitude line. And back in the ancient past, it was 22.5 degrees latitude. Why is that? They were following those same constellations. Mm -hmm. We write about it in the chapter on stargates. Oh. Uh, they were doing something in particular, and with those pyramids, that's why they're they're connected. See this whole this whole evolution thing that says that man, you know, arrived. They were all separated, and they therefore they shouldn't have the same knowledge. They do. We see it. It's it's everywhere, and and even mainstream scientists are now picking this up and saying there's a connection. Why are these pyramids similar? Why are they following the, you know, the the, the same constellations? Why are they very similar in technology? Matter of fact. Uh, you go to Peru and, and you look at Machu Picchu or or any of these megalithic sites. How did they? I mean, we talked about the pyramids earlier. How did they get those stones in place? There are hundreds of tons. And how weight. did they how did they match the design uh, when they um, had no knowledge of of these other people? Well, and that's the thing. I mm. think they did have knowledge. Oh, I they must they, have. They must have. And as a matter of fact, I think what you can do is you can actually trace back a lot of the mythology to what was going on with those races of giants. And, and you find them all through, not just uh, in the archaeological record or in the historical record and in the biblical record. Those things don't seem to contradict in this area. So when we're talking about Nephilim, we're talking about not just some very large human beings, but we're actually talking about a hybrid being. One that would be, and I, and, and, I, and I realize that there may be some people who are a little bit familiar with the Bible that may be listening to this, and they're going to be looking at a note maybe in their Schofield Bible that says that, well, that can't be right because, you know, angels are sexless. But that's not a true statement. Uh, every single reference in the Bible regarding an angel is male, and that is without exception. I did not and, know that. Um, those, yes. And, and by the way, there's something else about that, too. Angels in your Bible are wingless. Uh, ain't, ain't, there's not one single angel that has wings. Now, cherubim, which is a different creature, has wings. Seraphim, which is another type of, of angelic creature, has wings. Angels do not have wings. And, and if you were to see an angel, they have the ability. You know, and Aaron talked about out of our dimension, our, out of our time and space boundaries, and that's absolutely true. And they have the ability to appear as men and have done that. But they also have the ability to appear as an angel, and that's a totally different thing. In fact, that's a terrifying thing. And, so, and what you're real I'm sorry? Uh, no, so are you saying that these these angels came down to earth mated with the human women that were already here and and created these giant offspring that are then called nephilim that is correct 
Now, that is correct. Yeah. Besides finding this this huge footprints, are there any other um, archaeological finds as far as bones that would indicate these things were on Earth at some time? Uh, well, actually, there is now. Uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, just by the time you get into uh, the Roman period, uh, Caesar Gaius uh, was. Um, a man who uh, he he was known as Mac, Maximinus Thrax, and uh, he uh, stood eight foot six inches tall. Now uh, that's a big man, and men get that big. Tell you know those theories come you know with with some hard evidence. No one can say for sure. Um, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Uh, those forbidden. Um, uh, those fallen angels that that at the time of Enoch that were teaching that forbidden knowledge to men, and uh, matter of fact, the Book of Enoch uh, specifically names those fallen angels and what they were teaching. Now, could they have, you know, implemented, you know, those sciences to help men? That's indeed possible. Did they? I don't know. No one has learned the answer to that. That that's the million dollar question. <clears throat> Uh, how did those pyramids get built? Matter of fact, I was over there uh, to investigate that in 2008 myself. Got to uh, climb into the Great Pyramid and up into the King's Chamber. Wow. And let me tell you, when you're there visiting and you see that pyramid for the first time, I've seen it in pictures. And, and uh, but let me tell you, when you stand next to it and you look up, real uh, perspective, they are huge. It's incredible and. That's everyone walks away scratching their heads. No one really knows. But I just have a hard time believing that man did that by themselves. Is it possible that they did it by themselves? Yes. Is it possible that they had intervention? I think certainly the possibility is yes. I totally yeah, agree. Especially, yeah, especially when you look at, you know, how those buildings are configured and the fact that you know they the the face of true north as opposed to even our ability today to orient a building with the precision of those pyramids it's really a remarkable feat and and if i can just interject aaron and i have had discussions about this over and over we we both tend to look at those pyramids as being pre-flood which would be right during the time of the nephilim but, but if I can interject this, the byline of our book really, really talks about what we're, what we're talking about when we're talking about this, this race of, of hybrid giants, and that is that there's a real possibility. And, and if what we think is, if, if our understanding of the things that we see are correct, those Nephilim are going to be back. Now, and, now, that's going to change it from just being an archaeological discovery to being a present reality on the Earth. Right. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, with some of the other craft that have been um, seen and described, uh, they seem like they would uh, carry uh, some type of being that is smaller than us maybe three foot or four foot. Now, are you saying that... I don't know how many years, but, you know, Aaron, um, his doctorate and uh, his real area of expertise is archaeology. And just get Aaron talking about all of the winged serpents that you find all around the world. And as a matter of fact, not only that, but the hieroglyphs that show what genuinely appears to be spacecraft. Now... Boy, when you when you unearth something that's just been covered, you know, for hundreds or a thousand years, and you've got you've got what looks like a spacecraft etched in the wall, and and men looking up at it, that's a pretty amazing thing. And um, and so since that was Aaron's area of expertise, and he brought all that to the table, and then you know I had a, a and of course this book, there's no way. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the literature. In, in fact, that was one of the things we had to avoid. Uh, the first time I actually filmed a, a DVD study of this, it was just overkill uh, because of, you know, trying to prove the point. 
and taking the sightings back through history and bringing them up to present day, talking about the credible ones to try to prove to people that there really was something out there. Uh, but, but I think we did a, a good job of, of not overpowering everybody with that, but it was Aaron's expertise in the archaeology area, of which I don't really have any of that, and, and then, you know, the research that I've done in the past, and we thought that'd just make a perfect marriage for the book. It sure sounds like it. Um, now, Dr. Judkins, there's something in your <clears throat> bio that really caught my eye uh, regarding uh, you being credited with mapping uh, the longest contiguous dinosaur trackway in the Western Hemisphere near Glen Rose, Texas. Is that a coincidence or what? I mean, do you see any connection between this dinosaur thing and the fact of this huge sighting? Well, I don't know that it has any connection in particular to the dinosaurs. Uh, I do think that it's connected to the Glen Rose Stephenville area uh, for another reason, and that is that Glen Rose um, in the county of, of uh, uh uh, it, it, Glen Rose is Somerville County, and they actually have a nuclear plant um, in the county. Oh. Now, uh, a lot of these sightings have been and occurred around nuclear plants. Yes. Now, this wasn't seen directly over the nuclear plant. It was seen um, near the nuclear plant as it was heading towards Stephen, the road crew, came across a huge human femur. Now, according to that report, it was 47 inches long, and that fits right along the uh, biblical record of Deuteronomy 3:11 that talks about King Og of Bashan. So Joe Taylor of uh, the Mount Laco Fossil Museum sculpted this 47-inch human femur to scale, and uh, if, uh, so, uh, so the, the, the tip of, the, of this, you know, to put it to scale, the tip of the person's hand would be just above your head if you were about six foot. So these are, these are uh, incredible um, reports coming out of history from uh, Rhone in 1613. We have a report of a 30-foot giant. Um, Angola, uh, who was about 21 foot. Um, in 1577, there was one report. Uh, from Dr. Plater uh, at Lucerne of a, re of, a, of a giant remains of about 19 foot. And then you get the giants of uh, Patagonia who were between 11 and 15 foot. Now, even more recent than that, in uh, uh, Lovelock Cave in, uh, um, in Nevada, and you get Arizona and New Mexico, all throughout that region, you have reports of red-haired giants. And even the American Indians talk about this, especially at Lovelock Cave. Yes. Matter yes. of fact, they have found um, several giant skulls at Lovelock Cave that um, as well as some pestles. A pestle is a big, yeah, normally it's a big rock that they use to grind stone. I mean to, uh, excuse me, to, uh, to grind uh, grain against another, you know, uh, another stone surface. They would grind it for meal. And they found one pestle um, that was uh, at least 25 pounds, and they found another one even larger than that, and um, uh, it would take two grown men to lift that thing up to use it. That wasn't normal. Uh, so there was something going on over at Lovelock and throughout that region, even just, you know, um, within our recent times, that something was happening over there that it really scared those American uh, Native Indians. So... We do have reports throughout history. Now, unfortunately, a lot of those uh, remains, with the exception of Lovelock, I should add, uh, those remains are verified, and they're, they're, uh, uh, they're in the museum. Now, now, I don't think they're a public display, but, <clears throat> but they're known, and they're, they're there. But without exception, most of these have been lost throughout history, or they've been taken by the Smithsonian, uh, which is a very unusual thing. Uh, because they tend to get locked up and never seen the light of day again. Well, let me ask you a question, and, and this might be... 15 years old. I write about it in the book, but uh, that, that encounter always intrigued me. It's always kind of 
hasn't really bothered me. It's just that I didn't know what it was that I saw. Right. And so I went on with the re- you know with with the with the rest of my life, and and it never really, uh, I never really had a clear cut answer for that. I never could understand it. Matter of fact, I talked to some of my old high school buddies about it. You know, there were three of us, uh, three of those friends with me, and so there were four of us total. And you know, I was still in contact with them. And I asked them about it. I said, "Do you remember that night when, you know?" And and they said, "Yes, it was the Shamrock. You know, I, I've I've termed it the Shamrock Texas sighting because that's where it occurred in Shamrock, Texas, the summer of 1988. I was 17 years old at the time, and um, we saw something very unusual." in the sky. Uh, matter of fact, one of my friends uh, was going to go into the Air Force Academy uh, right after graduation, and he knew all about planes and jets, and and we all four agreed whatever we saw wasn't um, a normal aircraft. It wasn't a helicopter. It wasn't any kind of fixed-wing aircraft. Matter of fact, it was just a solid red ball of light, and it was floating along uh, in the sky not very high up, uh, probably um, just up above the horizon, and uh, very slow and just floating along, no sound to it whatsoever, completely silent, and no other uh, lights. There was no flashing lights, et cetera. And so we watched it for a while. Matter of fact, it intrigued us so much, we were getting ready to go home and get in the truck to go home. And this was about midnight. Uh, It intrigued us so much, we... We turned around and went back to the fence, and we watched it with um, with intrigue. Mm. Uh, and then, however long it was, minutes later, uh, we watched it for probably a, a good ten minutes. And uh, uh, the object then began to do very uh, weird uh, acrobatics in the air. Um, 90 degree turns, super fast, just things that could was totally impossible. Matter of fact, I, I I remember this very clearly. I reached down and pinched my arm to see if I was <laughs> really awake or if I was dreaming because I tell you, after we saw that, it went back to a steady state and it just was idle, uh, didn't float, just stood in a, in a motionless state, and no one said a word. And these are four, you know, we're we're 17 years old. No one said a word, and um, we watched this, and we continued to watch it until it disappeared. But I never was interested in it uh, uh, up until, um, I guess, about 2008. It really- a DVD study of this, it was just overkill uh, because of, you know, trying to prove the point and taking the sightings back through history and bringing them up to present day, talking about the credible ones to try to, prove to people that there really was something out there. Uh, but, but I think we did a, a good job of, of not overpowering everybody with that, but it was Aaron's expertise in the archaeology area, of which I don't really have any of that. And, and then, you know, the research that I've done in the past, and we thought that'd just make a perfect marriage for the book. It, it sure sounds like it. Um, now, Dr. Judkins, there's something in your <clears throat> bio that really caught my eye uh, regarding uh, you being credited with mapping uh, the longest contiguous dinosaur trackway in the Western Hemisphere near Glen Rose, Texas. Is that a coincidence or what? I mean, do you see any connection between this dinosaur thing and the fact of this huge sighting? Well, I don't know that it has any connection in particular to the dinosaurs. Uh, I do think that it's connected to the Glen Rose Stephenville area uh, for another reason, and that is that Glen Rose um, in the county of, of uh, 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 Glen Rose is Somerville County, and they actually have a nuclear plant um, in the county. Oh. Now, uh, a lot of these sightings have been and occurred around nuclear plants. Yes. Now, this wasn't seen directly over the nuclear plant. It was seen um, near the nuclear plant as it was heading towards Stephenville, according to Mr. Allen uh, and, and others' testimony. But I think that may have something to do with it more than the dinosaurs. Now, 
did the dinosaurs have any any role in that at all? I don't think so. Matter of fact, we've had uh, people come down and and um, and say that the dinosaurs and the aliens were together at the time. Now, I don't personally believe that, but what I do think is that there are uh, those fallen angels that have uh, interacted with mankind throughout history, and we see evidence of that in the archaeological record. Now, what they were doing and why they were doing it is a different, you know, is a whole different thing. But they're not here to um, to embrace mankind as the uh, as the thought, uh, you know, in, in today's society really purports. Lots have given testimony about things that they have seen and encountered. Uh, any kind of hard physical evidence that they may have seen, if you've ever. <laughs> You know, if you ever go out to Roswell and talk to anybody out there, you know, that, of course, you know, what do they really have? You know, they're never going to admit that. I think they see those kinds of things, but do they see what, you know, what is maybe moving behind all of this? No, I don't think so at all. I think they're going to default to the standard position of, um, at, at the very worst case, to say, no, you know what? This is just an intelligence from somewhere else that you know happened to be here, and and um, you know their reluctance to talk about that is you know for their own reasons. But I, I don't think it goes any further than that. Now, Aaron, do you disagree with that? No, no I, I don't. I I believe that the government knows about this. Um, uh, they don't know what it is exactly, but uh, for sure they know about it. There's been too many reports. From people high up in NASA, the astronauts um, um, from different missions, all the way back to Apollo, that they were seeing something. And these these are uh, men of uh, professionalism and integrity. Right. And I don't think they would come out and and put their careers or their reputations on the line, saying they would see something if they didn't. So what does the government know? No one knows. But I do think they have some knowledge. We just don't know how far the rabbit hole goes. Well, you know, one thing that I've, I've come to <clears throat> learn, I guess you could say, uh, from doing this show, is that there are two main factions within the UFO community. You have your, your scientific viewpoint, and then you have a biblical uh, viewpoint. And I think those are the two largest groups within the community. Um, but what I've found is that it's very hard to talk about the UFO topic strictly scientific or strictly biblical. There, there does seem to be some type of mix in there. Um, but what, what do you, what are you trying to get across in this book? Are you just trying to get people awoken? Uh, to what you believe is going to happen? Is that the basis for this book or or just for knowledge? Well, it's 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 really um, it's really a combination. The 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 first intention is to wake people up to to this real occurring phenomenon. Now, uh, does everyone uh, uh, some are, are are not so good experiences, but some are reporting to have good experiences, like Whitley Schreiber would be one of those uh, in his book Communion that he wrote way back when, and 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 he talks about this. He's very open and and inviting to these invitations, but there's a, a um, there's an agenda behind that, and so the book is to unveil that agenda of why they are here and what their intention is. And 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 once you understand that that uh, they are malevolent in nature, their game, their end game is deception, and they are not here to help humanity. It brings a whole nother light on the UFO phenomenon because there's a connection that's associated with this that uh, will lead people into a misunderstanding if they embrace something as an ET from another planet, say the planet Nibiru or the planet X or what have you, that we are here to help you. 
Now, if you watch any of the movies or, or you go back and, and you notice that if there's any kind of, of, of common thread against the earth, that mankind <clears throat> tends to pull together as one. Right. And so um, I believe that, that this connection is the evolution connection. And, and, and back in the 1980s, Shirley MacLaine stood on the shores of the Pacific Ocean and, and proclaimed herself to be God. And and I believe that evolution connection is associated with this uh, in, in the panspermia theory and the cosmic evolution that says that okay if if life evolved then life should be out there somewhere else now that's what evolution says um, however these um, um, entities are not from other planets they are very hyperdimensional they are never seen entering or exiting our atmosphere. They are already here, and they have been here, and they are those fallen angels that have um, uh, been here on this earth as long as mankind has been here. That's why we've seen them throughout history, and their purpose is to deceive mankind, and there's a coming delusion that's coming down the pike that is even going to get worse, and I believe they're using this UFO and evolution connection for the next stage of of, – of 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 the evolution, uh, which says that you're at your pinnacle now. Well, we're here to show you how to become your own gods. That's the that's where this is heading, and it's surely and it's surely uh, McLean's I am all over again. Uh, so, um, but they are 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 very deceptive in in that re- regard. Right. But we will be there at the symposium. Uh, debuting the book, and we'll be there signing autographs, et cetera, and talking to people uh, about the book and about other people's work. We're, we're interested in what other people have to say as well, so it's going to be a great time to, to, to get to meet people there, and we hope to see you there. Yeah, um, I would love to uh, talk to you guys again uh, after the book is out and people have had a chance to read it uh, you know, and, and hear what the feedback is. Now, let, let me ask you, uh, with, uh, with your book, is it uh, an easy read for people that are not very biblical, in a sense? Is it a biblical-style book, or is it, uh, you know, is do you need biblical knowledge to understand a lot of this stuff? No, I don't. I don't think so, Rick. You know, um, I, I think that the book is is written so that anyone can pick it up, and even if they don't have a background. Uh, in UFOs, even if they just have a, a casual interest in it, I, I think it's done in a milk-to-meat fashion. It starts you off with the evidence, first of all, and, and begins to walk you through that. And then as we introduce our idea of what we believe is going on and why we believe that, then that's kind of presented there. And uh, we've tried to keep it simple, um, and, and we've tried to keep it short. That's why the you know the book is only about 210 pages or so. And um, it's it's like kind of like, kind of like, cramming one of the nephilim in a matchbox. But, <laughs> um, but, but uh, I, I think to honestly answer your question, I think it's a pretty easy read. Good, good. Well, listen, I wish you guys the best of luck uh, with this book. I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Good luck down in Glen Rose uh, later on this month. And uh, thanks for taking the time to talking with us tonight. Well, thanks, Rick, for having us on. Okay. You guys have a great, uh, great evening, and we'll stay in touch. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh Good night. Well, that was extremely interesting. Um, You know, like I said, uh, I seem to see two factions with this UFO community. Uh, one being the scientific, one being the biblical, as far as the viewpoints uh, towards UFOs. Uh, Before starting this show, uh, I was strictly scientific, uh, as far as my viewpoint, and uh, after listening to a few of the guests that have brought in a more biblical uh, view, there are things there that you can't ignore, I I must say. it just adds another piece to the puzzle. So anyway, mated with the human women that were already here, 
and and created these giant offspring that are then called Nephilim? That is correct. Now, that is correct. Yeah. besides finding this, this huge footprints, are there any other um, archaeological finds as far as bones that would indicate these things were on Earth at some time? Uh, well, actually, there is. Now, uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, just by the time you get into uh, the Roman period, uh, Caesar Gaius uh, was um, a man who, uh, he, he was known as Mac Maximinus Thrax, and uh, he uh, stood eight foot six inches tall. Now, uh, that's a big man, and men get that big today. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal has a, 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 a foot size, I think, of a, of a 15 or so. So that's not what we're talking about, though. We're talking about not just big, large men uh, that suffers from, you know, uh, you know, uh, overstimulation of their anterior pituitary gland. Um, uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about uh, modern-day giantism. We're talking about a, a breed of hybrid fallen angels and humans. And as a matter of fact, my uh, one of my other colleagues, Joe Taylor from the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum, um, has a 47-inch human femur that came um, out of the uh, road construction uh, from the 1950s. There was a report in southeast Turkey um, that had... Uh, um, as they were uh, digging uh, and excavating for a highway through there in the, in, the, in the 1950s, the road crew came across a huge human femur. Now, according to that report, it was 47 inches long, and that fits right along the uh, biblical record of Deuteronomy 3.11 that talks about King Og of Bashan. So Joe Taylor of uh, the Mount Blanco Fossil Museum sculpted this 47-inch human femur to scale, and uh, if, uh, so, uh, so the, the, the tip of, the, of this, you know, to put it to scale, the tip of the person's hand would be just above your head if you were about six foot. So these are, these are uh, incredible um, reports coming out of history from uh, Rome in 1613. We have a report of a 30-foot giant, um, Angola, uh, who was about 21 foot. Um, in 1577, there was one report.